Caledonia. That was what the Romans called it. To them, it was a wild, mysterious land on the frontiers of their empire and of the known world. Here, they believed, lived a tall, red-haired barbarian people who had strange customs, could wield magic, and lived among all manner of superstitious beasts. Never were the Romans ever able to tame this land, nor its people, and as the centuries passed, nor could any other foreign people truly subjugate the spirit of Scotland. Scotland is a nation with a proud, fascinating, at times mind-boggling, and ancient history, with traditions and culture passed down through generations which stand out among the nations of the world. Thousands of years of history are found here, from the ancient Picts, whose unique culture remains largely mysterious to us, to the proud medieval kings and warriors whose struggles remain legendary, to Scotland's role in helping found the greatest empire the world has ever seen, and the fascinating tales in between. Despite its relatively small geographic size, Scotland's impact on world history has been great. However, that history is often misunderstood. Scottish history has been portrayed in a number of popular works, such as literature, plays, movies, and that sort of thing, but these depictions are not always accurate. What is the real Scotland? Who are the real Scots, and what is their story? Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. I'm Justin. The Scottish story is one which deserves to be told. Thank you for joining us as we now tell it making Scotland the eighth nation in our History of Nations and Peoples documentary series, whose history we have fully covered. Before we begin, I would like to thank Yohusep Lopez, Nerius Schweigsda, Marifer69, Frank Martis, Denny Underwood, Matt Moreland, Snicked, and Zero for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. One of the first times anyone ever wrote about the land that we today call Scotland was in the 4th century BC. The author was the fascinating Greek explorer Pythias of Massalia, who seems to have traveled around Britain and Ireland. It is not known how much Pythias interacted with the natives, but if he had, he would have encountered members of a culture already thousands of years old. Structures like this one, the Ring of Brodgar, on Orkney littered the Isles. Their purpose isn't always clear, but they likely held great religious significance to the people of this land, whose pagan religion was greatly intertwined with the natural world. Further light is shed on the culture and lifestyle of these peoples when the Romans first invaded Britain in 55 BC under Julius Caesar, though his conquests were limited, and certainly did not reach Scotland. The Romans never lost interest, however, and a true invasion of Britain occurred in 43 AD under the Emperor Claudius. Their conquests, encompassing territory of modern England and Wales, became Roman Britain. It would not be long until the Romans sought to control the whole of the island. In 77 AD, the Roman general Gnaeus Julius Agricola tried precisely that as he expanded further into modern England and into modern-day Scotland. He encountered tribes much like those in the south, but according to some accounts, people who were taller and more commonly had red hair. Much remains unknown about them, and of what we do know, much comes from the Romans, who most certainly wrote with a bias. They were Celts, who lived in hill forts, farmed, and herded animals. They were not united, and a number of tribes existed throughout the area. The Caledoni, for example, for which the area was named by the Romans, was only one of these groups. They spoke varieties of a now extinct form of a Celtic language, which would have been somewhat more like Welsh than modern-day Scottish Gaelic. They followed a religion similar to the rest of the Celtic world, which, as mentioned, was deeply entwined with nature, and the gods, spirits, and beings which directed and inhabited it. Roman general Agricola saw a number of successes here and occupied part of Caledonia, but overall, the Romans never could hold on to the territory. Each time they tried, they ended up relinquishing it. The territory failed to pay for itself, it was quite far from the Roman heartland, and the natives proved to be too resilient to occupy. Accordingly, the Romans walled Caledonia off. They built two walls, actually. In 122 AD, the less expansive Emperor Hadrian built Hadrian's Wall. The Antonine Wall was built in 142 AD to accommodate further conquests, though they didn't last, and by the early 3rd century, Hadrian's Wall came to represent the true boundary between the Romans and the Caledonians. 
the Roman invasion encouraged the Celts of Caledonia to cooperate with each other further. One confederation which formed was a group of tribes which came to be known as the Picts, first described in the 3rd century as a people from the north. The term was an exonym, coming from the Romans, from Picti, meaning the painted people. For much of the 3rd century, the wall seems to have kept the northern people at bay, but in the 4th and 5th centuries, the situation in Roman Britain began to change as the Roman Empire started buckling under the weight of larger issues erupting at home. Taking advantage of the empire's weakness, raiding parties from Caledonia breached the walls, terrorizing the inhabitants of Roman Britain. The Romans were too distracted to form a proper response in a territory so far from Italy. By 410 AD, years before the Western Roman Empire as a whole collapsed, the Romans left Britain, leaving the island, including Scotland, to a new future. Four groups would become key to Scotland's future. The first were the aforementioned Picts, natives of the area. Second were the Britons. Celtic remnants of Roman Britain, active in the south of Scotland, namely what would become the Kingdom of Strathclyde. Another example would be the Welsh. Third were the Germanic groups which crossed into Britain following the fall of Rome, the Anglo-Saxons, with specific reference to the Angles who founded the Kingdom of Bernicia, encompassing part of the southeast of Scotland. Bernicia later became Northumbria, or the Kingdom north of the River Humber, Fourth were the Scotty, the Scots, the people who, as you might guess, gave Scotland its name. However, what one might not expect is that the Scotty were Gaels from Ireland, whose kingdom of Dalrida extended from Ireland into Argyle in modern Scotland. The term Scotty was another Roman exonym, possibly used to refer to Gaelic pirate raiders specifically. Why Scotland is today called Scotland and not Pictland, well, we shall see. These four groups would turn the island of Britain as a whole into a patchwork of kingdoms and countries whose borders fluctuated frequently from wars and disorder. Amid this period of chaos and uncertainty, in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries, people turned to a new light which was sweeping the isles, and would soon reach Scotland. Christianity Christianity had been firmly established in the Roman Empire by the time of its collapse, including in Roman Britain, but the Celts outside its borders remained pagan. The new religion would slowly trickle into these places before and after the empire's collapse, but the work of missionaries would firmly root it in the cultures of the peoples inhabiting modern Scotland. Missionaries from Ireland, such as the famous Saint Columba, are said to have been key in converting their Pictish neighbors. Unfortunately though, we can only make educated guesses about how exactly this and many other contemporary events unfolded. Written records of early medieval events, names of leaders, exact locations of borders, and things like that are scarce, with many key stories and events no doubt being left unrecorded, or written with a bias. This is especially the case for Scotland. As time passed, all the inhabitants of Pictland became known as Picts. One of their primary kingdoms, among many, was known as Fortriu, which achieved considerable dominance over Pictland, also called Pictavia. The king of Fortriu may have functioned as a kind of high king over all the others, sort of like what was going on in Ireland. There were other kings which acted independently, at times fighting each other, but each of them paid a kind of homage to the high king. The Picts would ally, trade, fight, and be influenced by their neighboring states over this time period as well. Over time, in fact, foreign influence would become so great that the Pictish tradition, culture, and language was largely lost. The three languages spoken today in Scotland are derived from the Gaels, for Scots Gaelic, and the Anglo-Saxons, for English and Scots. To complicate this arena of competing and scattered peoples further came a new contestant in the late 8th century. Invaders from Scandinavia who would change everything and leave a permanent mark on Scotland. Vikings. The Viking Age is said to have begun in 793 AD with an attack on Lindisfarne, an undefended and wealthy monastery part of the nearby Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. The Vikings were pagans who had no qualms about attacking holy areas that no Christian would ever dare. As unchallenged masters of the sea, they could appear anywhere at any time. Bad news for an island. 
They came first to raid, but driven by a variety of factors in their homeland of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, perhaps such as overpopulation, they would later come to settle, seeking land on which to do so. Many of them would go to England, but some, primarily Norwegians, would also seek their fortunes in Scotland. The initial moment of contact between the first of the Viking raiders and the people of Scotland is not known. Again, the lack of literacy and reliable records means that there isn't a clear chain of events with clear causality. One possible point of contact was the sack of the monastery at Iona in 795 AD. It would be the first of multiple raids on the island. Here, the monks and all inhabitants were killed. Not long after, it seems, with this new invader on the scene, the inhabitants of modern Scotland set aside their differences to resist them. The king of Dalrida, Aid Macbonta, and the king of the Picts, Uwen Mac Owen Gusa, are said to have taken a stand against them in 839 in an unnamed battle, but were defeated and both died fighting. Scotland was taking a very hard hit. In such tumultuous times as these arose a man who would be called the founder of Scotland. His name was Canade MacAlpine, or Kenneth MacAlpin. Kenneth MacAlpin possibly had become King of the Gales around 834 AD. However, his origins remain a matter of debate. By either means of invasion or negotiation, perhaps a bit of both, under Kenneth MacAlpin, Dalrieta and Pickland merged to create the Kingdom of Alba, from an old Latin word for the island. This unification is often seen as the beginning of Scotland. However, that name, as well as the name Alba, was not yet used, and Kenneth I referred to himself as King of the Picts. He was crowned in a city, more the size of a town, called Schoon. Schoon would become the traditional location for coronation of Scottish kings, and would come to serve as a kind of capital of Alba, although kings for much of early Scottish history traveled frequently, not doing much settling down. MacAlpin is said to have brought a holy relic and a stone to Schoon, a stone which remains famous to this day. It is known as the Stone of Schoon, or also the Stone of Destiny. It's important to remember, Kenneth was high king over many other kings, a bit like Brian Boru if you've watched my Ireland documentary. He was not the sole king, and Alba was not perfectly unified. It is not known whether Dalrieta or Pigland pushed for this union, but it was likely an inevitability that was expedited by the threat posed by the invading Norsemen. Following this union, Gaelic culture began to predominate. Though the kingdom's center of power lay in Pigland, north of what's called the Firth of Forth, which is in this area here, Scots Gaelic became the language of Alba, and Gaelic culture slowly replaced the old Pictish one. Kenneth I would not expel the Vikings from Scotland, but he would provide the basis for the nation that would one day do so. In this time, the area of Dalrieta, in the rugged west of Scotland, which was easier to access by sea than by land, was heavily taken over by Vikings. The Kingdom of Alba, subsequently, existed primarily in the east. Kenneth I died in 858, and was succeeded by his brother, Donald I, who reigned for four years. In 862, he was succeeded by Kenneth's son, Constantine, who reigned until 877. Alba's situation was precarious. In the north and west, the Vikings settled the islands of the Hebrides, Shetland, Orkney, the Isle of Man, multiple parts of Ireland, and the portion of the mainland. Here, the intermarriage of Scots and Norse was quite likely to have happened in many areas, but in others, DNA evidence suggests an intentional removal of the native populations. In the south, in England, the Dane law came into existence, partially as a result of the conquest of the semi-legendary Viking leader Ragnar Lothbrok's sons. And of course, to the east, across the sea, lay Scandinavia herself. Alba, therefore, was surrounded. Vikings began increasing their attacks on Alba itself amid this activity, and King Constantine met them in battle. It did not go well, however. At the Battle of Dollar in 875, it is said, a great many Picts were slaughtered in a crushing defeat. King Constantine died in or after another battle in 877. Meanwhile, in England, a great king by the name of Alfred was resisting Viking incursions as well, and having more luck. In 878, at the Battle of Eddington, the Danes, under Guthrum, were defeated, and a treaty was signed between them, bringing a kind of temporary peace between them. 
The first time the phrase King of Alba was used was around 900 AD, following the death of King Donald II. His reign, which began in 889, was spent, of course, fighting Norsemen. It is recorded that the Scots scored a major victory over the Norse in Innes Sibsolian, but Donald II likely died later, fighting an unknown enemy, potentially the Vikings, at the Battle of Donatar. He was succeeded by his son Constantine II. Among all the early kings of Scotland, Constantine II is perhaps the most well-remembered, and for good reason. The 10th century would consist of Europe beginning to forge a more proper resistance to the Norsemen. Scotland was no exception. In 904, a victory is recorded to have been won over the Vikings, which saw the death of a Hiberno-Viking, that is to say Norse-Irish, king, Imar wa Ivar. In 906, King Constantine swore to uphold his duties as king in Schoon. Because of the power Constantine II was securing through his victory, and as the first living king to be called King of Alba, some have considered this point to be the birth of Scotland. As his power grew, Constantine likely secured some sort of agreement, be it an alliance or a placement of a puppet king with Strathclyde against the Vikings. Fighting would continue against the Norsemen throughout Constantine's reign. Gradually, however, the Norse suffered a series of defeats. The 10th century was a poor one for them throughout the Isles. Power shifted and the tables turned. Athelstan, grandson of Alfred the Great, became the first king not merely of the Anglo-Saxons, but of the English in 927. Having defeated the Norsemen, the power of Wessex now spread across much of England, all the way up to the border of Alba, posing a new threat to the island. In the face of this, alliances changed. Alba and Strathclyde now sought to challenge this new rising power with Viking help, specifically the Vikings of Dublin. In 934, war broke out between the early kingdoms of Scotland and England, which saw an English victory. Constantine pledged obedience to the English king thereafter. This obedience would not be lasting, however. War would come again. Sometime in 937, in a location lost to history, Scottish forces, allied with those of Strathclyde and Viking Dublin, took a stand against English domination at the Battle of Brunenburg. The battle, one of the bloodiest fought on the island to that point, was a defeat for the Allied Kingdoms. However, because of the after effects, it was not decisive, and the war ended more or less in a draw. If England had lost the battle, it would have certainly broken up their kingdom. However, even with a victory, the battle had shaken English power, to the point at which Athelstan could not force the submission of his neighbors. It would be some time before England dared to invade the north again, and four years later, England itself ruptured again following Athelstan's death. Alba, now also called Albania, and in some circumstances, Scotia, land of the Scots, for the time being, was saved. Constantine II, who had brought the security to his homeland in his 43-year-long reign, which was quite an exceptional length for the early Middle Ages, abdicated in his old age to become a monk in 943, and the throne thus passed to his cousin, Malcolm I, that year. The Viking Age would continue in Scotland for some time, and Malcolm seems to have died in battle against them in 954, like so many of his predecessors. He was succeeded by Constantine's son, Indulf. The Scottish kings of the early Middle Ages came to the throne by a process called Tanistry. The system was Gaelic and had replaced the earlier systems of the Picts. A Tanist was an heir apparent to a king or chief, but also applied to landowners in general across the country as well. The key difference is that this heir apparent was often elected by the heads of a family, and chosen from any of the members of the patrilineal line who were of age and in a fit state of body and mind. So the Tanist could be a son, but also a brother, cousin, grandson, uncle, nephew, whomever was deemed the best choice as long as he was related to the king on his dad's side. He would replace the king when he died or, in some circumstances, if the king was disqualified. Women were barred from succession, as was matrilineal succession, though the earlier Picts, interestingly, seemed to have practiced matrilineal succession. When the new king came to the throne, the next Tanist was elected. 
it isn't radically different from primogeniture, the process which most kings later on used, but it was different enough to stand out. This system caused regular infighting and competition, though that's not to say that the other kingdoms of Europe were much more stable. The early Scottish monarchs are well known for their infighting and internecine struggles, which shortened their life expectancies. Many died in combat, even after the Vikings became less of a threat in the late 10th century as a result of this competition, and in fact most died in battle in general. Indolf likely died in combat against the Vikings. King Dove, Cullen, Kenneth II, Constantine III, and Kenneth III were each killed either in civil wars or in wars against foreigners. On March 25th, 1005, King Malcolm II came to the throne after defeating Kenneth III. Under him, Scotland's borders would further solidify. He might have placed his grandson, Duncan, on the throne of Strathclyde, and around the year 1018 fought the Battle of Corum against England, which he won, securing Scottish territory north of the Forth of Tweed. His unusually long reign, which ended in 1034, was followed by Duncan I, his aforementioned grandson. Duncan was not a popular king, and his reign was short. He died in combat against his own vassal, who challenged his rule, the Mormaer of Moray, a man named Macbethed Macfinlay, better known as, well, it's not a theater, so I'll go ahead and say it, Macbeth. If the video crashes later, I, I guess I'll know why. Macbeth is a well-known character from Shakespeare, but the real Macbeth was a much different person involved in different circumstances. Duncan was not murdered. He was a young man killed in battle by another with a fairly legitimate claim to the throne based off of the system of the time. Macbeth's reign seems to have been one of relative peace and stability, as he reigned for 17 years and was so secure in his reign that he was even able to travel to Rome on a pilgrimage. It was not totally peaceful, however. In 1054, a brief war with England destabilized his rule. This destabilization allowed a rival, the son of Duncan I, Malcolm, to challenge him at the Battle of Lumponen in 1057. Here, Macbeth was killed, and Malcolm III came to the throne a year later. And so, with yet another king killed by his successor, the MacAlpins had returned to power as the High Kings in another domestic conflict of which we unfortunately know little. However, things would soon be changing, not simply for Scotland, but for all of Britain and Ireland. Historians place Malcolm III as the first of the House of Dunkeld, though others begin this dynasty with Duncan I, his father. Malcolm III's English contemporary was a ruler named Edward the Confessor. Malcolm most likely knew him quite well, likely staying in his court during most of the reign of Macbeth. Edward the Confessor was a weak king who had, toward the end of his life, found himself in a precarious little situation. He had promised succession to his throne to multiple different people. One of those people was William, Duke of Normandy, a French duchy settled by Norsemen throughout the past century and a half in the north of France, ostensibly under the French crown, but in reality an independent duchy. When Edward died in January of 1066, William expected the crown to go to him, but it instead went to another Anglo-Saxon, Harold Godwinson. This was unacceptable. William planned to invade England, but he was not alone. The Norwegian King Harold Hardrada invaded first. Scotland and Norway actually planned to seize English territory together. Malcolm III, who would later be called Canmore, meaning Great Leader, had a number of territorial ambitions in England, primarily in Northumbria. When the Norwegian invasion came, however, he did not involve himself. Hardrada met the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September, 1066. Here, the Anglo-Saxons were victorious, as Hardrada was killed with an arrow to the throat. As Hardrada lay dead, the battle came to be considered the last conflict of the Viking Age. Perhaps, in a sense, but the Norse were still active in the British Isles, especially in Scotland, where they still controlled a sizable portion of the modern nation, and would for centuries to come. Soon after, William of Normandy reached England and at the Battle of Hastings, not even a month after Stamford Bridge, William the Conqueror defeated Godwinson, claiming the title of king for himself. 
Godwinson was the last Anglo-Saxon king to rule England. The French-speaking Normans were now in charge, and their ambitions, their conquest, would not be limited to England alone. All the while, cultural influences from England and from France were making their way into Scotland as a result. Feudalism, for example, a much more solidly hierarchical system, with the king on top of a series of vassals and lords, was becoming encouraged, by figures including Malcolm III. This challenged the traditional Gaelic structure of society, but many Scots felt that certain changes to their society might be necessary. Scotland was beginning to look beyond its immediate frontiers, to different horizons than eastward anxiously at Scandinavia and south at England. It was about to be involved in broader European politics. Malcolm III Canmore, originally hoping to seize territory from the Anglo-Saxons, now empathized with them and took Saxon refugees into his kingdom while conducting raids on the now Norman territory. Among the refugees was an exceptionally pious Anglo-Saxon princess, Margaret of Wessex, sister of the exiled Anglo-Saxon heir to Godwinson, who became his second wife in 1070. In 1072, following their harrying of the north, as the Normans had solidified rule in England, William marched an army up to Scotland. With this, Malcolm III paid homage to him, recognizing his rule. This, like many equivalent examples in the past, was a temporary and disingenuous measure to buy the Scots peace and time. Malcolm was intent on expansion into Northumbria, regardless of who owned it, and war came on and off throughout the rest of his reign, against William I and II. Like nearly every Scottish king of the era, Malcolm III and his son died in battle at Alnwick in November of 1093 while fighting the Normans in Northumbria. He would not succeed in annexing Northumbria, but had regained control of Strathclyde sometime in the 1070s, ownership of which fluctuated. Margaret, who would later be canonized as a saint, died only days later. Their rule had a major impact on modernizing and strengthening Scotland. Malcolm was not able to conquer England, but the Normans found themselves unable to truly conquer Scotland. For Margaret's part, her piety and charity were well known, and she led religious reform which brought the Scottish church more in line with Rome. Anglo-continental influence is seen in the names given to Malcolm's children by Margaret. Edgar, Alexander, David, Matilda, and Mary. The Anglo-Norman language began to arrive in Scotland as well. Under his dunkled successors, this influence would only grow. Malcolm was succeeded by his brother, Donald III the White. Donald was very possibly not his brother's intended heir, and may have usurped the throne. Regardless, a dynastic struggle erupted as he, his sons by his first wife and sons by his second wife, each sought to sit upon it. In May of 1094, Duncan, Malcolm III's son by his first wife, invaded with Norman support and seized power. However, by November, an uprising had occurred against Duncan II and his foreign supporters, led by the old Celtic lords who held particular disdain for foreign influence, which led to his death. And Donald was king again by November. This did not last long. Margaret's son Edgar claimed the throne in 1097 once again with English support. Edgar reigned until 1107, and was succeeded by his brother, Alexander. However, Edgar chose to divide the kingdom between Alexander and their brother David. David was chosen to rule over Strathclyde, also known as Cumbria. The three brothers were notably religious, much like their mother. Alexander too, however, much like his father, had a liking for combat. He became known as the Fierce after victory in a battle against an unknown enemy, potentially the Norwegians of the Northern Isles. He died in 1124, and the realm was reunited under David I. The reigns of David's two brothers were comparatively uneventful, and like many Scottish rulers, a fair share of the details have been lost to history. However, the reign of King David I is well remembered, and some would go so far as to call him one of Scotland's greatest kings. David, already facing rebellions, began with a complicated coronation ceremony. He, very much Normanized, having even married a Norman woman in 1112, viewed the ceremony as pagan. Indeed, aspects of it might have dated back to the ancient Caledonians. However, he endured it and Schoon's significance remained. 
Still, David's reign would contain major milestones in the transition from a Celtic society to a more Anglo-Norman one. As far as the rebellions he faced went, he was able to suppress them by 1134 with Norman assistance and maintain his reign. This period followed with a series of major governmental reforms. He was careful not to provoke the old Celtic lords of his kingdom, but created feudal offices and structures similar to those in England and France where he could. This new bureaucracy was coupled with the foundation of what are called burghs, B-U-R-G-H. Fifteen or sixteen of them, in fact, were founded during his reign, and that was only the beginning. Berwick, Roxburgh, Stirling, Edinburgh, Perth, Aberdeen. This moment in Scottish history was undeniably a borough moment. The boroughs were novel settlements with officially established borders and royally granted commercial privileges, different from the old settlements which typically consisted of villages surrounding monasteries. Most of them would be founded in the east in settlements which likely already existed in the Scottish lowlands, but David sought to control the highlands as well. Scottish influence extended further into the west and north during David's reign as well, though the Norwegian rulers there, largely independent of the Norwegian king, would resist his efforts to encroach on their territory. The boroughs would serve as centers of production and commerce with many special trading privileges granted by the king in royal charters. Because many of them were founded in the southeast, territory which once belonged to the Anglo-Saxons, Middle English became a common language used throughout the boroughs and trade, interaction, and immigration from England and France only increased this linguistic influence. Anglo-Norman and French knights in David's service were given important lordships and land as well. David would also found monasteries across the kingdom and bring the church closer to Rome. Though anticipated by recent monarchs, King David's reforms were so impactful on Scotland that his 29-year reign is sometimes referred to as the Davidian Revolution. Scotland was changing. David's relations with England were relatively stable. Having spent time in the Norman court, the English viewed David as the civilized king of a barbarian land. He seems to have gotten along with King Henry I and swore fealty to Henry's heir. The problem was, Henry I's succession was not exactly a simple process. A civil war, known as the Anarchy, erupted in England between 1135 and 1153 between Matilda, Henry's daughter, and Stephen of Blois, his nephew. Amid this crisis, with David considering himself free from the oath, he invaded England in 1136. He agreed to a temporary peace but resumed conflict in 1138 on Matilda's behalf, or so he claimed, capturing much of Northumbria. This invasion is said to have been exceptionally brutal, with much of the English countryside being ravaged. On August 22nd of that year, the English met the Scottish at the Battle of the Standard, where the English inflicted a major defeat on the Scottish army. The Scots were said to have had about 20,000 men present and lost about 11,000. Despite this, David's forces remained strong, and in 1139, a treaty was signed which was in favor of David's ambitions, granting the Scots northern territories in part of Northumbria and Carlisle. In 1153, a peace treaty was signed between the two factions of the anarchy. Matilda's son, Henry of Anjou, was named heir to the aging King Stephen. As it happened, Stephen died the following year. Henry of Anjou subsequently became king of not only England, but ruler of a large portion of France as well, including Normandy, Anjou, and Aquitaine. This massive dominion, which would later expand into places like Brittany and part of Ireland, is referred to by historians as the Angevin Empire. David had died in May of 1153. In a succession of primogeniture, as his son had died the year before him, he was succeeded by his grandson, the 12-year-old Malcolm IV. Malcolm IV's reign was troubled. He was faced with foreign rivals in the west under the Norse king of Argyll, Somerled, in the southwest with Fergus, lord of Galloway, and in the south by the expansionist English king Henry II. Land was lost to England, and Malcolm swore fealty to the king, but his battles against Fergus and Somerled ended in victory. Malcolm was sickly throughout his reign, and died in 1165 at the age of 24. The throne then passed to his brother, William. William was much more well-received than his sickly brother, posthumously earning the title on Loven, the lion, after his standard, which bore a red lion on a yellow flag. This standard would later evolve into Scotland's royal standard. 
William was a capable leader in many areas, but his wars with England, waged throughout his long reign, were disastrous. In 1174, while campaigning in England, he and his 60 or so bodyguards were discovered by a force of a few hundred Englishmen who stumbled upon his camp. His army was split up and occupied in other areas, so he and his bodyguards were alone. William decided to engage this English force with his bodyguards. Upon charging, he shouted, Now we shall see which one of us are good knights. This Battle of Alnwick in July of 1174 was over very quickly. William's foolish decision to stand and fight led to his capture. He was taken to a dungeon all the way in Normandy to prevent his recapture. The English then occupied part of Scotland. In exchange for his release in the Treaty of Falaise, William the Lion was forced to pay a ransom and swear obedience to King Henry II, a man becoming emperor in all but name. Scotland had been subordinated to England. This was a humiliating outcome and led to discontent against him. But just as it seemed that Scotland was going to become another Angevin territory, luck struck the kingdom when Henry II died in 1189. Henry's son, Richard, also referred to as a lion or lion heart, succeeded him. Richard the Lionheart's interests were more in distant lands to take part in a crusade, but he lacked the funds to do so. To solve this issue, he turned to the Scottish king. The two lions struck a deal, and England rescinded the Treaty of Falaise in exchange for 10,000 silver mercs that year. The Scots effectively purchased their independence. Relations did not necessarily improve with England, however, and soured even more when King John came to the English throne when his brother Richard died in battle. War broke out again as John was threatened by William's consideration of an alliance with England's other enemy, the French. John again received submission from William. William died not long after in 1214. His reign had achieved a number of domestic accomplishments and he was Scotland's longest reigning ruler up to that point, but his foreign relations were a disaster. The throne went to his son, Alexander II, that year. In line with what might as well have been a coronation tradition, a rebellion broke out in his first year of rule, which was suppressed by the king and his forces. Once again, Scotland found a way to get itself out of submission to England. This occurred during the Barons' Revolt in 1215, which occurred against King John of England. As war broke out, Alexander led an army into England, marching all the way to Dover in the south of England. It failed to win much territory, but achieved its intended result of securing a degree of freedom. King John died in 1216 and was succeeded by Henry III. Alexander II of Scotland and Henry III of England sought to end their hostilities. This certainly was not achieved for long, but in the Treaty of York in 1237, significant progress was made in how these two nations would deal with each other. An official border was agreed to. This border stretched from the Solway Firth to the mouth of the River Tweed. It remains much like this to this day. During the reign of Alexander II, a group of advisors and nobility, especially those from the boroughs, had been coming together to meet to discuss important issues and influence decision-making. These assemblies would later evolve into the Scottish Parliament. With the southern border stable for the time being, the Scottish kings then turned their eyes northward. The Norwegians had occupied much of the highlands, and especially the surrounding islands, for around four centuries by this time. It was time for them to leave. Alexander attempted to purchase the islands from the Norwegians, but his offers were repeatedly declined. Thus, in 1249, he mounted an expedition to seize Argyll and the Hebrides in the west. He achieved much in Argyll, however, while on the way to the Hebrides, aged 50, he died of a fever. The fight was to be continued by his son Alexander III, who at that time was only seven. Thus, the fight would have to wait. Alexander gained control of the government in 1260. Two years later, he resumed his father's conflict against the Norwegians. King Haakon IV of Norway raced to meet him, doing so in the west of mainland Scotland. Here, on October 2nd, 1263, a force of Scottish warriors took a group of Norwegians by surprise at the Battle of Largs. It was not a brutal battle, both sides losing less than a thousand men, but the battle went down in history as the moment that the Scots repelled 
the Norwegians. King Haakon retreated to Orkney, where by chance he fell ill and died in December of that year, causing his forces to return to Norway. Alexander and his forces used the opportunity to press into areas such as the Island of Skye. In 1266, the new king of Norway, Magnus IV, agreed to negotiate and finally sold the Hebrides and the Isle of Man to Scotland. Scotland now began to assume control over much of its north and west, taking on more of its modern shape. However, the islands of Orkney and Shetland were to remain Norwegian. Alexander II and III, with their treaties of York and Perth, are accordingly well remembered in Scottish history as kings who brought about an age of expansion and then of peace, taking crucial steps toward making Scotland what it is today. Some have considered this a golden age in Scottish history, but was it? Or did it simply seem that way compared to what was coming? Alexander III had three children, including two sons by his wife, Margaret. However, his wife and all three of his children died within a few years of each other during his lifetime. In 1284, Alexander III, therefore, was left with no heir. He was only 44, however, and married a second wife, a woman in her early 20s, and tried for another heir. Indeed, she became pregnant. Then, disaster struck again in March of 1286. King Alexander fell off his horse while riding in the night to meet with his wife to celebrate her birthday the next day. The king now needed an heir, and all hope rested with his unborn child. The child, however, was stillborn. I promise this depressing little segment is important to the story and understanding just how bad Scotland's luck was. Anyway, the sorrow visited upon the royal family would soon be visited upon Scotland, as a succession dispute erupted with no clear heir. His only descendant was his three-year-old granddaughter by his first wife and daughter, Margaret, who had married the King of Norway. The Scottish felt that they had no choice but to leave the crown to Margaret, and set up a council of guardians, a group of regents, to rule until she was able to assume the throne. The Guardians were also tasked with finding a husband for her, who would be the real ruler. The authority of the Guardians, however, was swiftly challenged by other claimants to the throne, including Robert de Bruce, 5th Lord of Annandale, grandfather of Robert the Bruce, and John Balliol, Lord of Galloway. Rebellion broke out while Margaret was still in Norway, and though it was suppressed, King Eric of Norway was reluctant to let her leave until the situation in Scotland was resolved. The Scottish, Norwegians, and English then met to mediate the situation. It was agreed that Margaret would be queen, and would marry Edward, King of England's son and heir, who would be Edward II. Then, when she was on her way to Scotland, at the age of seven, she died of illness. A new succession dispute then arose called the Great Cause, which saw numerous claimants and threatened civil war. Once again, the Scottish Parliament asked for English assistance in mediating the situation. That was a mistake. The English king, Edward I the Longshanks, was a very ambitious monarch. During the negotiations, he made his own demands on the Scots and required them to recognize him as their feudal overlord. Scotland was in no position to resist, and this would have been their outcome anyway, had the union of Margaret and Edward I's son produced a son. Scotland would be independent, but subject to the English king. Next, he influenced the assembly to choose the aforementioned John Balliol to be king. King John I was crowned at Scone in November of 1292. It quickly became clear he was to be a puppet king. The situation soon became intolerable. Edward demanded that the Scottish assist him in his war with France, a fight in which the Scots saw no point in joining. They denied his demands, a violation of their agreement. Scotland was now on a path to war with England, in what is remembered as the First Scottish War of Independence. Having invoked the wrath of the Longshanks, the Scottish immediately sought the assistance of the only country that the English hated as much as them, the French. The Scots and French formed what would be known as the Auld Alliance in 1296. Their decision to become BFFs was a very sound strategy, as any war that the English planned to fight against either of them would result in a two-front war on opposite ends of their kingdom. 
However, for the time being, it just made Edward even angrier, and he moved to invade Scotland. In 1296, he did so. The Scottish and English met at the Battle of Dunbar in April. It was a minor battle, but led to the rapid and brutal English occupation of the Scottish lowlands. Not long after, King John was captured, forced to abdicate, imprisoned, and then exiled. Edward, who would later be known as Malleus Scotorum, the Hammerer of the Scots, had won a great victory. In symbolism of his victory, the Stone of Scone was taken and transported back to England, where it remained for centuries. The Scottish were occupied and had no king, but was it to last? They were far from broken. By now, a Scottish identity had been forged from the various ancient groups which had come together to create the kingdom. They were not eager to have it erased. In such times, heroes tend to arise. Two of Scotland's most famous heroes, in fact, came onto the stage in this conflict. The first was a man named William Wallace. Let me say now, so that no one gets mixed up in the coming story, the real William Wallace was not Mel Gibson. Braveheart was a great movie, but my friends, do not take it as proper history. It's more of a fiction which was only roughly based on history. Anyway, Edward initially received the submission and support of many Scottish nobles and families, including the Bruces. However, the Burgesses, rulers of the boroughs, still resisted. In 1297, Edward's rule had quickly become intolerable, and rebellions broke out across the country. In the north, rebellion led by Andrew de Moray broke out. In the south, the son of a minor Scottish noble, this William Wallace, led a revolt after his wife was allegedly killed by a local English sheriff. Wallace is recorded to have been a man of intimidating physique, dubiously said to have been seven feet tall by poets over a century later. Importantly, he also likely had military experience and knew what he was doing. Moray and Wallace soon joined forces, with much of northern Scotland under their control. On the 11th of September, 1297, they met the English at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Here, about 6,000 Scots faced off against 9,000 Englishmen, who had gathered and now had to slowly cross the narrow Stirling Bridge to relieve the city of Dundee. The Scots waited for the right moment to strike, allowing a portion of the English force to cross the bridge. Once a sizable but partial force had crossed, they pounced. In the chaos, the bridge was crowded, with too many English soldiers trying to go both ways, and it collapsed under them, causing many soldiers to drown. Taking minor losses, the Scots killed around 5,000 Englishmen. However, one of the few Scottish casualties was Moray, who would die of his wounds not long after. Wallace was named Guardian of the Kingdom of Scotland. He was not at all king, but one of the regents during the Interregnum. He then invaded England, raiding much of the north. The situation became so out of control that Edward I left France to deal with the Scots directly. In 1298, they met at the Battle of Falkirk. Here, the Scottish were crushed by the English and Welsh longbowmen, and Wallace narrowly escaped. He then resigned as guardian and disappeared in coming years, likely traveling to France to encourage further French assistance. He returned to Scotland in 1303 to continue the fight, but was captured by the English and publicly executed. With Wallace dead and the independence movement faltering, Scotland would now require a new hero. One came in the form of perhaps Scotland's most famous king, Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce now sought the Scottish throne, but recall, of course, that he was not alone. The prominent Scottish leader John Comyn the Red also had a claim to it. Comyn had been a more ardent rebel, in fact, with Bruce having wavered between sides. On February 10th, 1306, the two rivals met to discuss the situation in the Greyfriars Church in Dumfries. Here, Bruce lost his temper when he learned that Comyn had revealed Bruce's plans to be king to King Edward. Therefore, Bruce stabbed Comyn in the neck. Killing a man in front of an altar got Robert the Bruce excommunicated by the Pope, but at least he had eliminated his rival. On March 25th of that year, he traveled to Schoon to be crowned King of Scotland. Despite some bumps, the resistance was back on. The Scots and English met at the Battle of Methven in June of 1306, where Bruce was defeated and forced to retreat. 
he was also faced with conflict with former supporters of Komen, and was forced to take shelter in Rathlin Island. The following year, though, Robert and his brother Edward returned to Scotland to resume the fight. Fortune struck them as Edward I of England died that year. He was succeeded by his son, Edward II, who was less interested in Scotland and faced quarrels at home. Over the coming years, Robert slowly took Scotland back and even began raiding England. On the 23rd of June, 1314, Edward II's army of 20,000 met Bruce's army of 7,500 at the Battle of Bannockburn. Here, despite being outnumbered, the Scottish crushed the English and forced Edward II to fall back to England. It was a great victory, but the war was not over yet. Robert the Bruce decided to keep pushing against the English, sending his brother Edward to Ireland the year after to open up a second front against them. Edward Bruce was crowned High King of Ireland. The brother's intention was to create a Gaelic kingdom, encompassing Ireland and Scotland. However, as he found, he did not have much support in Ireland. Many Irish sided with the English, and Edward Bruce was killed at the Battle of Fogart in 1318. The war continued on. In the 1320s, however, Robert's excommunication was lifted. In 1327, Edward II abdicated. The following year, in 1328, Scotland emerged victorious, with Robert the Bruce recognized as king. It was a great victory. The Scots had won their freedom, but would it last? Robert the Bruce died the year after, and was succeeded by his five-year-old son, David II, thus a regency was needed. Not long after, the English supported an invasion of Scotland once again, under the pretext of restoring the man they believed to be the rightful king, Edward Balliol, son of John Balliol, to the Scottish throne. This would begin another long fight between the two powers, aptly named the Second Scottish War of Independence. Once more, the English would occupy the southern portion of Scotland. The English and Scots loyal to Balliol soon secured victories. David II was forced to flee to France, and Balliol claimed kingship, though Scottish resistance continued, preventing him from truly achieving it. Balliol, in fact, was chased out of Scotland, though he would make comebacks and brutal civil war and war with England was to continue, evolving into a guerrilla war against the invaders. Much of Scotland was devastated in the fighting. Famine ensued in the chaos. The English, under Edward III, however, would soon be distracted. In 1337, Edward III was involved in an inheritance dispute. He claimed to be the rightful king of France. This dispute with France would lead to a dynastic struggle which would last for 116 years, in a series of conflicts together called the Hundred Years' War. Scotland, France's ally, would play a role in these wars. With England distracted, the Scots regained much of their territory and even invaded northern England in the coming years. By 1341, the situation in Scotland was so stable that David II, now 17, returned to Scotland to lead the fight. In 1346, a force of 12,000 men gathered under him to invade England, which met an English force of 6,500 at the Battle of Neville's Cross on October 17th of that year. It was a major setback to the Scottish gains. Here they were defeated, and King David II himself was captured by the enemy and imprisoned in England. Now, England, once again, held the upper hand over Scotland, but fighting slowed as they focused more on France. By 1357, England needed money to continue its war with France, and decided to ransom the king back to the Scots. A deal was reached in the Treaty of Berwick, and David II returned to rule Scotland. He had been in captivity for 11 years, but was still only 33 years old. The truce did not exactly bring about a period of happiness and stability. Scotland had been ruined, not only by the decades of war, but the Black Plague which reached the country in the 1350s, killing off a large portion of its population. The debt, which was owed for the king's release, around 100,000 silver mercs, seemed impossible to fully pay in these conditions. Indeed, the terms were renegotiated. The Second Scottish War of Independence had ended. Scotland, though badly bloodied, had retained its independence. David II died in 1371, and, childless, was succeeded by his nephew, Robert II. 
He was to be the first of the House of Stuart. The House of Stuart would play a pivotal role, not only in Scottish history, but English and British history. Not long after this time, Scotland would climb out of the medieval world and into the Renaissance, the beginning of the modern world. Scotland would change, and these changes would often bring with them challenges. The rise of the clan system, the Protestant Reformation, strife in the kingdom of their southern neighbors. Then, eventually, the Scottish King James VI would be faced with a major opportunity to inherit the throne of England. Though only held in personal union, his inheritance would be the first step in creating a permanent union of Scotland and England, which would give rise to a united kingdom. Scotland would be a part of the British Empire, the greatest empire the world has ever seen, but not before they gave a shot at their own colonial ambitions. How would Scotland fare in this eventful time, facing challenges such as the exploration and colonization of new worlds, which saw Scots travel from America to Asia, the Enlightenment, the Thirty Years' War, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars, alongside their new English partners? Furthermore, were these Englishmen partners, or were they rulers? In the next video, which will be titled something like Scotland's Role in the British Empire, we will look at Scottish history from the dawn of the Renaissance up through the series of events, challenges, and stories leading to the modern world. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To help with the cost of producing these videos, a donation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to our current patrons once again listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. This has been a Fire of Learning History of Nations and Peoples documentary. Top Alive for watching.